old. My parents brought me to America from Indonesia where I had grown up to go to college and then they flew back to Indonesia. I remember that moment when I knew their plane was taking off, pausing to pray for their safe travel. And at that moment, I suddenly realized I was alone in this strange country. And I began to wonder, was I really ready to be here all by myself? Of course, at that moment, it was too late. They had already left. So it worked out. <laughs> I grew up and everything worked out fine. But I remember at that moment and in many, many moments afterwards, <laughs> taking comfort in the fact that the God who was with them on the other side of the world was also with me here in America. Last fall, my husband and I took my daughter off to college. And now that I'm on the other side, I am pretty sure that my parents weren't ready to leave their daughter here in the States either. But they had to trust that they had raised me well and that the same God that was with them in Indonesia was also with me on the other side of the world. I wonder how Jesus felt as he prepared to leave the disciples, especially when their final question was, Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom of Israel? But we see a little bit of his understanding of what was happening in his final prayer with them. He gives us a wonderful picture of his relationship with the Father. The Father has glorified, has magnified Jesus because Jesus has magnified the Father. He remembers that the disciples had belonged to the Father long before he met them, so he is confident in putting them in his Father's hands. He knew he had taught them what the Father wanted him to teach them and that the Holy Spirit could do much more within them than he could do as a separate human being. Remember last week, Jesus assures his disciples that even though he is leaving, they will be okay because the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, will be coming. But my guess is that the disciples still did not think they were ready to be left alone. My last week of seminary, one of our professors told us that we now had 10% of what we needed to know to become pastors, good pastors. Three years for 10%. The rest we would learn on the job. Of course, I mean, I, I must admit, I was like, oh my goodness, all this money and all that's all I got. <laughs> but uh, surely I'm more prepared than that. But he knew that it's impossible to teach everything that we need to know to become good pastors. In three years, our professors could only trust that they were giving us the tools for us to continue our own learning on our own. I don't know what the percent the disciples knew after three years. They had dreamed big of free Israel where everyone could worship God without persecution. We heard it in the psalm, the poor are taken care of, God's enemies are, have disappeared, the righteous have a safe home. Surely this would be the best environment for everybody to be able to live out God's wonderful life that he wanted from them. But their vision was too small. God's vision was for all people, not just Israel. God's kingdom was spread, was going to be spread over all the world. Jesus has to remind them that only the Father knows the times and the seasons when these things will come to pass. Only the Father has the complete picture God's vision for the disciples was that they were to be witnesses of what God was doing at the moment, but they were to leave the results in the hands of God. 
I'm pretty sure as the disciples stood looking up at the sky, most of them were thinking, so what now? In fact, they were staring so long at the sky that God had to send two men in white, we assumed that they were angels, to tell them, hey, Jesus is gone, and you have a job to do before he gets back. So they followed the example that they had seen Jesus do time and time again, retreat and pray. And as they met in that upper room for 11 days from Ascension Day to the day of Pentecost, my guess is, as well as praying, they shared their memories about Jesus. They studied the scriptures again and again to see what it said about the Messiah. They reminded themselves what Jesus had taught them. So when the day of Pentecost came, they had a much better understanding of God's vision for the world. They knew that their salvation came through following Jesus and he taught them how to come to God, who God was. So on the day of Pentecost, they were ready, ready to receive the gift of God's Holy Spirit. As Jesus had promised, the Holy Spirit would guide them with what they knew into new situations, how to live God's life in a fallen world, how to build the kingdom of God where they were at now. Thy kingdom come. It's a request we make every time we pray the Lord's Prayer. But let's face it, each of us has our own kingdom in our mind as well. Our own vision of what the world would make the world a better place. Visions for our life, visions for our families, visions for this church. And I think of how many times I pray, Thy kingdom come, and I am still very much like the disciples asking, Lord, is this the time you're going to make everything right in my kingdom? The Ascension reminds us that only the Father knows the times and seasons. Our work is not to be staring up at the sky waiting for Jesus to come back. Our work is to be witnesses of what God is currently doing in our lives in this place. Which is why we need to set apart time like the disciples did for gathering together with other Christians to study scripture, to hear what God is doing in our lives, and to pray together. So the church throughout history has historically set aside time, the time between Ascension Day and Pentecost, which is next Sunday, <clears throat> to pray for a new awareness of the Holy Spirit to remind us of God's vision for the world and to ask for power to be able to fulfill God's vision. This year, the Archbishop of Canterbury, Justin Welby, is encouraging this, the church now to, to, to do this tradition once again. In our modern world, we can connect with Christians all over the world digitally to pray together the Archbishop has invited us to focus on this theme of Thy Kingdom Come, and I'd like to read a little of what he says. Prayer is the place where change begins. As the apostles waited and prayed together following Jesus' ascension, so we pray. The same Holy Spirit that enlivened, excited, and enriched the disciples on Pentecost is given to us today also. We live in challenging times, and sometimes it is hard to know how to pray. Our prayer for these next week is, Come Holy Spirit, thy kingdom come. It expresses our need and desire for the healing presence of Christ in the in-between places we find ourselves. So, if you are technologically inclined, you can Google that phrase, Thy Kingdom Come, and they have a daily video, and you can type in what God has been doing in your life, what things you're praying for, and then read what everyone else does. But even without technology, we are all connected 
in our prayers, in Christ. People all over the world are praying this week. Our presiding bishop, Michael Curry, who, who made the first video for this, uh, for this time, said, points out that prayer changes the chemistry of this moment because it invites God into the equation. So when God's people gather to pray, amazing things happen. What is God's vision for you? For your personal life? For this church? How does it compare with what the Holy Spirit is just, how does your understanding of that vision compare with what the Holy Spirit is just waiting to do? And so I invite you to pray. Just a few minutes a day this week, whether you do it as soon as you get up or right before you go to bed or as you eat lunch, the time is up to you. Ask Jesus to send the Holy Spirit to fill our lives, to remind us of who Jesus is and to make us ready to build the kingdom of God. Come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your people. Kindle in us the fire of your love.